A new warning over Chinese cyber attacks. Intelligence officials say hackers spent up to five years in U.S. networks in an effort to attack critical infrastructure. Wait, what, well, five years? How do you stay undetected for that long? How do you maintain persistent connections over a remote network? In this video, I will show you one way on how hackers do this using a command and control framework, also known as C2. While there are a lot of available options out there, we will use one of the most popular, which is Sliver. Before jumping straight to Sliver, let's have a basic understanding on what a C2 is. At a most basic level, reverse or bind shells are used to gain access to a remote device. While they are an easy way of establishing connection, they are not stable and most of the time noisy and can easily be caught by antivirus softwares. Due to those limitations, C2 frameworks are created to gain stable, persistent and stealthy connections to a victim device. In addition to that, uh, C2s are also used to perform post-exploitation and lateral movement across the victim's network. C2 normally consists of a server, client, and agent. Server is the brain of operations which handle important tasks such as generating exploits, maintaining sessions, and recording data of compromised devices. Client is used to connect to the C2 server and interacts with the compromised machines. Agent is a program that is running on the victim device and reports back to the server. Now that we have a basic understanding about C2, let's explore some of the features of Sliver. Sliver is written in Go and actively being developed by many security enthusiasts. Installation is easy and can be done using a wrapper shell script. The script downloads the Sliver server client binaries and creates a system D service for the server. It stores a configuration and database in slash root. Take note that it also puts the log file on the same directory, which will be helpful when troubleshooting for issues. Being familiar on how different tools are installed in our system not only aids us in fixing problems, but it also gives us a better understanding on how it operates and how it was designed to work. The most basic functionality of Sliver is generating implants and allowing them to connect back to the Sliver server via a listener. Implants are also the same as agents. Implants can operate in two modes, beacon and session. In beacon mode, an implant periodically checks into the Sliver server and returns back an output if they are assigned a task, such as listing the content of a directory. In session mode, implants can give you an immediate feedback that can act like a traditional reverse shell. For the remainder of this video, we will use a Windows machine as our target victim. I will also turn off Windows Defender for demonstration purposes. Let's open up Sliver Client and generate a Windows implant. I will use an HTTP listener and save the file in slash temp. It may take a few minutes to generate an implant. During this process, the implant is being obfuscated using Garble, which also adds up in the total generation time. Sliver will generate a random unique name for the implant, which makes it easier to identify when navigating through beacons and sessions inside the Sliver client. For demonstration purposes, I will transfer this implant to the Windows victim and run it. I forgot one step, which is to start the HTTP listener. If this is not started, the implant will not be able to talk back to our Sliver server. Once I started the HTTP listener, you can see that the implant immediately connects back to our Sliver server showing some basic information such as the beacon ID, remote account, and remote operating system of the compromised device. Now, since we have established a connection to the remote device, let's explore around on what we can do. To interact with the implants, select the beacon ID. Inside the beacon, we see several subcommands through the help menu. Although we have some basic info about the remote device, as we saw from the implant connection a while ago, we may need more than that. So let's execute the info command. But we can see the exact Windows version build number, which is useful in finding exploits for privilege escalation. We can see also the interval and jitter values used. Jitter is a random delay added to reduce suspicious network activity on the remote device. Now let's do some basic operations such as listing the contents of the folder on the remote device. Since we're in beacon mode, we need to wait for the output to be reported back to us by the implant. Once the task is finished, the implant gives you a nice formatted output. We also have an option to check the progress of each task. There are a lot more things you can do inside beacon mode, such as uploading a file, executing a shell code, and pivoting, but I will not discuss all of them. I'll let you play around on your own. 
Now that we have an idea how to use beacon mode, let's explore session mode. Inside beacon mode, we can ask the implant to give us a session via the interactive command. Once the session is established, we can switch to session mode by selecting the appropriate session ID. Do note that when you switch to session mode, the beacon name turns red. Commands inside session mode is just the same with beacon mode. The only difference is that you no longer need to wait for the command output because it will be returned immediately. We've been playing around with different commands inside beacon and session mode, but if you notice those are wrapper commands that aims to mimic the native operating system commands the C2 operator wants to execute. If there are commands we want to run but is not available within Sliver, we can get a native shell session inside the compromised device using shell command. When getting a native shell session, Sliver reminds us that this is bad for OPSEC because this is noisy and can easily be caught on the remote network. To give you an idea, opening a native shell session produced this event on the remote device. Because of those reasons, beacon mode is still preferred to have a stealthier connection. Only use interactive sessions when needed. So far, we learned that Sliver provides us an easy way to establish connection to our target victim by generating an implant and running it inside the remote device. Although this works fine in less secured environments, it may not work well in networks with tight security. First problem is the resulting implant binary is large and tends to raise eyebrows the moment it touches the disk on the remote device. Second is you typically only have a small space to insert your shellcode inside the vulnerable function, making it impossible to fit a big implant. For these reasons, Sliver allows you to put an implant to the target victim using stage payloads. Before going straight to the command line, I'll discuss first on a high level how stage payloads work because this will make it easier to carry out the attack. If you are already familiar with this topic, you may skip this section. The idea behind stage payloads is that the attacker sends a small piece of code to the target victim. That small code will do a callback to the attacker machine to deliver a larger code with more functionalities. In Sliver, these small pieces of code are called stagers. They are typically inserted into small memory areas via a vulnerability on the application such as buffer overflows. Once the stage errors gets executed in memory, they will call back to a stage listener. Once the stage listener receives the request from the stager, it will send the implant code through that same connection. In order to determine the implant characteristics, the stage listener is attached to a profile that defines how the implant code will be generated such as architecture, jitter values, and connect back URL. While the implant code is being sent to the victim, it is being written to memory in another region. This is what makes it stealthier as it never touches the disk as opposed to the previous section where we have an implant binary that is run on the victim terminal. Once the implant code is fully constructed in memory, the stager will pass the control to the implant code. The fully constructed implant will now connect back to sliver server forming a beacon. Now let's open up a terminal and simulate a stage payload. First, I will create an implant profile. I will use a minimal settings for demonstration purposes. You can see that the connect back URL is created. So I will start this MTLS listener to catch the connection request of our implant later. I will now start a stage listener and map it to the profile we just created. Remember our small stager code will connect here to get the implant code. In the end, we will have two listeners running one for the stager and another for the implant. Next step is to prepare the stager code. Since we don't have a valid vulnerability on the victim machine to insert the stager code, we will simulate it by turning it into a small executable that we can run manually. There is a handy stager code provided by Sliver. I will compile this inside the target and run it. Going back to our terminal, we see that the stager is successfully connected to the stage listener. After connecting, the stage listener sends the implant code. Once the implant code has been fully written to the memory on the target, it now runs and connects back to Sliver server on the MTLS connection. Finally, the beacon registration is complete and we have now fully established connection to the target. Sliver and other C2 frameworks has more interesting features such as auto exploitation, traffic encoders, and advanced stealth tactics but I won't cover them since our main focus is on basic functionalities and stage payloads. I'm glad that you reached the end of this video. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments and let me know what other topics you want me to cover next time.